everyone, and uh, very welcome to the second IEDE webinar series. So uh, my name is Nahid Mohajeri, and I'm a lecturer at uh, UCL uh, Institute for Environmental Design and Engineering. The webinar today is on harmonizing spaces, human-centric lighting principles, and soundscape design for enhanced environments. So, which will be presented by our two guest speakers. Uh, very welcome to our guest speakers today from my side. Just before we start the webinar, I should say that the IED webinar series in 2023-2024 are primarily based on the research teams at the Institute. So today we have two webinars, which are based on the acoustic and soundscape research teams leads by Francisco and the light and lighting research teams leads by Jemima. So Francisco and Jemima will be chairing the session. They are present here. And uh, so over to you, Francisco, please, for the first webinar. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, Nahid. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Francesco Aletta. I'm a lecturer in building physics and soundscape here at Institute for Environmental Design and Engineering. And I'm pleased to introduce our first guest today, Dr. Uh, Gunnar Serwen. Um, Gunnar is um, a scholar and landscape architect from the uh, Department of Landscape Architecture, Planning and Management of the Swedish University of uh, Agric Agricultural Science, SLU, in Sweden. And today he's going to talk about uh, soundscape actions. So when we think about sounds, typically we uh, imagine um, you know, uh, our sound environments to be uh, polluted and we tend to approach the management of sound environments uh, with a noise pollution approach. Uh, soundscape uh, studies are trying to uh, shift this towards a more proactive approach and uh, see how sound environments can be used to enhance and support healthier um, environments. Uh, so with this, I would like to introduce Gunnar, please. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you for the invitation to to come here. It's uh, great to be here, and I will uh, uh, looking forward to discussing afterwards. I will now share um, screen first, and then uh, share some of the research I've been carrying out uh, before coming here. So. Going a few years back in time, uh, I will focus on a tool uh, uh, called Soundscape Actions. So the, the title for presentation is Soundscape Actions, Considering Everyday Sounds in Planning and Design of Outdoor Environments. And just like um, Francesco mentioned, I have been working also in line with the soundscape concept. So rather than focusing on negative aspects, of sound, I have been trying to uh, find ways to um, emphasize positive experiences and potentialities in the sound environment. With this being said, uh, the tool is uh, was developed mostly in noise exposed situations. So it's also a matter of combining these two worlds. On the one hand, trying to abate noise, and on the other hand, trying to also think about the uh, positive aspects or for instance using masking strategies covering noise with water sounds is a good example of that um so <clears throat> as i mentioned we're going a few years back in in time here and so these starting points are from when i started my uh, PhD work on uh, trying to find a way to make landscape architects, planners, and related disciplines to open up possibilities to think more about sound. Because as we know, everyday sounds have far-reaching effects on health, well-being, and quality of life. This is well established. It's mostly been studied uh, traditionally in terms of noise, but we have seen recently also reports highlighting the positive uh, aspects of sound environments. So that was one important starting point, and especially in relation to uh, what was uh, uh, quite strong discourse uh, around 
and before the millennia shift that it was a critique of visual focus in architectural disciplines particularly uh, in relation to the modernistic tradition now i think uh, this has started to change uh, uh, and i think uh, much owing to the soundscape uh, discourse and its way of uh, um, creating interest uh, for these disciplines and so but that was an important starting point that even though it was important it was clearly important with sound it tended to be this uh, uh, not given enough focus in uh, when i did my uh, training as landscape architect for instance it was seldom that we spoke about other things than noise so <clears throat> that was uh, second starting point and then finally also uh, an awareness of the complexity surrounding planning and design of outdoor environments so uh, there was there seemed to be a need for a kind of inspirational tool or strategies to kind of um, entice or uh, having these uh, disciplines uh, create an interest for starting to think about sound. And the outcome of uh, the thesis and uh, also some uh, studies that have followed afterwards is a tool called Soundscape Actions. And in this image, we see one of the workshops that was uh, in which the tool was developed. Uh, so it was very much a collaboration between landscape designers, master students, artists, and acousticians. And the, the idea was that if, if, if uh, to have a tool that would kind of be in line with these uh, the disciplines that were then going to use the tool, they would, should also be involved in the process of development. So that was the idea, and we had a series of workshops. I would go back to that uh, shortly. But uh, uh, to summarize, the, the Soundscape Actions tool could be described as a framework to facilitate soundscape design of outdoor environments. And it is um, uh, essentially, you could also describe it as a collection of ideas to inspire uh, new ways of thinking or to be a kind of um, dictionary almost, if you're interested in doing a solution, what is the uh, previous knowledge situation regarding research, so it was also a way of structure, uh, previous and ongoing research. And this is also uh, uh, partly because research is always developing, but uh, also because cities and contexts are changing. Uh, so it is a work in progress. And currently there is a uh, a list of 33 design actions and they are divided in three main categories. So to start with, um, the three main categories were <clears throat> pretty much based on previous research, especially a paper uh, by Brown and Muhar from 2004, uh, highlighting uh, localization of functions, uh, which is could be described as more of a kind of overarching planning perspective, whereas the two reduction of unwanted sounds and introduction of wanted sounds are more kind of design oriented or once the, the locations of functions, the overall planning has been settled, then Reduction of unwanted sounds is perhaps uh, uh, oriented a bit towards traditional environmental noise management, including several solutions such as noise screens and acoustic properties of materials, but in the tool also highlighting uh, aesthetic and design ways of dealing with these kinds of solutions. And then final introduction of wanted sounds is um, how we can further enhance or kind of emphasize qualities in the sound environment by attracting different positive sounds. Um, the main categories were uh, first summarized in this way, in, in this matter, in a paper that evaluated the design competition 
in landscape architecture. Uh, and uh, then it was also highlighted that each main category should be considered uh, also in relation to, to the other. Uh, so each one should be considered. And if it is uh, the, the chances that it is a good soundscape or optimal soundscape design solution is if all of these three categories have been given at least uh, consideration. So that was the, the starting point. And this, uh, these kinds of ideas uh, have been uh, uh, circulating in the disciplines even before, as I mentioned. What was the main, perhaps, new contribution with the Soundscape Action de Design Tool is are the, the subcategories. And these are the ones that are actually called Soundscape Actions. And they were developed uh, subsequently in three workshops in landscape architecture, three different contexts. Uh, the idea was to be able to highlight uh, uh, several different ideas and from different uh, different sites, different constellations. So we wanted to gather as broad of a repertoire of ideas as possible. And in total, 69 participants came up with 182 ideas from these three workshops. And as you can see, there were cooperation between landscape designers, acousticians, and artists. And this was uh, described in a paper from 2017. So the way it was done is uh, um, they, each proposal was summarized in a, a few keywords and then they were clustered into soundscape actions so for instance in this image we see all the ideas that were related to water they were kind of summarized into into one group and the soundscape action was defined on each of these groups were also given a position in the main framework the three main categories Uh, this resulted in uh, 23 soundscape actions divided in categories 1 to 3 as 4, 9, and 10. Uh, so that was uh, a kind of uh, the framework was established. And then the next step was to formulate each of the actions and going into previous research, for instance, regarding masking strategies. What, are, what is the current situation? What do we know about masking? What is important to consider? And what should be avoided? And then each soundscape action was described in relation to, to this um, literature review and subsequently also made available online on soundscapedesign.info uh, design tool. That's a kind of... Um, um, way of making it accessible. And here we have uh, all the soundscape actions that were resulted in the first uh, development phase of the tool. Uh, they are not here divided into categories, but uh, you can see uh, the individual soundscape actions here. So I would like to continue the presentation by uh, firstly going through uh, the basics of uh, the three main categories, providing some examples of soundscape actions, and then subsequently also describing a, a more recent development um, that was conducted in, in the context of Japanese code. But let's start with going through the tool, uh, the way it was originally designed. So first step, localization of functions, as, as I mentioned, it is more related to overall planning uh, and strategic decisions in, for instance, uh, urban scape or uh, landscape. Then it, is, it was uh, um, defined as ensures on compatibility when locating different functions in the landscape or in urban context then. It's important to consider what are the existing sounds, existing buildings, topography, relationship between functions. 
uh, we can see in this um, schematic illustration an example uh, of understanding a situation for instance we have a road to the left and then a building the red blocks here next to the road and then we we can uh, for instance the the light green circle is an area which could be expected to be relatively quiet because we have a uh, shadow from from the building there uh, in relation to the highway so these kinds of uh, analysis are uh, part of the the first uh, step understanding the situation it can be in different scales also um we can consider in this case we have a, a park and then we can um also exemplify one of the soundscape actions in this category, uh, which is avoid unwanted sounds, which is uh, self-explanatory. In this case, we have we can expect to have technological sounds uh, surrounding the park. And then when we want to locate, for instance, a water uh, or a natural landscape with, with sounds that are kind of uh, in line with that experience we want to create we, we should consider of course to avoid the technological sounds and uh, by for instance uh, providing enough distance or in other manners uh, ensuring that we have quite relative quietness while other um, activities such as uh, social uh, act socially active uh, aspects could be uh, more uh, close to to the to the noise source um so once the localization have been decided uh, we come into the next step of uh, the main category which is reduction of unwanted sounds so once the site location is fixed what can we do to further reduce unwanted sounds and Several of these uh, soundscape actions we find in this category, as I mentioned previously, are related to environmental noise management. But some are new and, and they are also perhaps defined in a slightly different manner because we had a collaboration with the landscape designers and artists. So I'd like to mention a few examples of uh, this and uh, maintenance is one example. Uh, if we design, uh, for instance, maintenance plans that uh, lawn mowers are not to be used, but instead we should use uh, live animals, we get a reduction of sound because we don't have the lawn mowers. Uh, we, we can also consider vegetation soil as it has good absorbing qualities. If we use that, especially next to roads, uh, we can get a significant reduction of um, uh, of the the noise and the general overall uh, decibel levels. Uh, perhaps the most obvious example is noise screens, which have tended sometimes to be uh, a bit technically oriented, uh, but we can also um, find solutions which are integrated into the landscape design. For instance, we have an example of a pergola here um, and another project in the bottom that was also part of the, the thesis work that I did. And, and we have also to the left, another example is reduced source activity, reducing speed limits to reduce noise. We have a, we can change topography. Uh, we have a here example of a noise mound along a highway. We can think about buildings as large screens and consider strategic locations of buildings. Uh, or um, for instance, high walls can also have a similar effect. And then the third main category interaction of wanted sounds. Once the site location is fixed, what can we do to further introduce and or enhance wanted sounds? And here I'd like to emphasize the uh, water features as a really interesting example, not only because of the sound of water itself, but as probably many of you are aware since before, water features have a 
good capability to mask out uh, sound of traffic. Uh, so that's also an interesting uh, combination of soundscape actions. Uh, biotope design is really interesting as a landscape designer uh, was all, already uh, natural to, to think about these kinds of uh, relationships, how we can create better environments to support wildlife, uh, vegetation, and and in uh, next step also animals that make pleasant sounds so we can consider that there is access to water, feeding possibilities like old trees for to cater for insects, um, uh, vegetation with uh, which has uh, uh, berries and other uh, Food for, for uh, songbirds, for instance. They like to have hiding places and, in general, multi layered vegetation. It's also appreciated by, by songbirds if we focus on that particular uh, group of animal. We can also uh, consider uh, have the same line of thought for, for human activities to attract humans attract activities and then when we design certain functions in in the landscape or in the city we we also can expect to have a certain kind of soundscape for instance cafe market kindergarten and tivoli that can be uh, 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 present a, a vibrant soundscape which is positive in another way than of course to uh, compare to a natural soundscape um, and then sounds of vegetation, another important uh, sound of uh, in the third category. Here it is uh, uh, pertinent to think about strategic positions. For instance, along with uh, high buildings, we tend to have a lot of wind. So that can be a good position to locate the, the trees and other plants or on high ground, where it is also wind or in wind tunnels, can consider the height of, of the trees, or uh, for instance, lower species which come closer to the visitor, such as uh, bamboo and, and grasses. So poplar is a, a well-known good rustler. We have birch, beech, uh, which uh, is good also in the winter time. Uh, and then we have bamboo and, and, and several grasses, partly because they come so close to the uh, visitor. Walking material is another uh, very good thing to think about. Uh, we have examples wood, gravel, autumn leaves, creating a multisensory experience sometimes, and also an interaction with the environment, which is quite can be quite intriguing, like uh, you, you get a response when you're uh, exploring the environment from your own footsteps. Going into more uh, like um, electroacoustics and uh, art music almost, we have sound sculpture as a other soundscape action in this category. Where we have a uh, uh, rather than a traditional visual uh, statue, we can have also uh, multisensory experiences like an electroacoustic installation or as uh, it has been uh, existing for a very long time, also in the, the wind uh, generated sound from an Aeolian harp. So there are several examples in this category as well. So to finalize this part of uh, the presentation, uh, this image can be used to as a reminder that uh, um, uh, taking into the whole context and uh, emphasizing uh, consideration for multiple uh, strategies, uh, think about all the three main categories, basically. Uh, this is a hypothetical uh, environmental setting where we should consider 
the, the localization of function. In this case, we have uh, a road to the right, and we are trying to create a tranquil space uh, to the left. Then we first have a distance to the road. Uh, so that's the first category. And then we have a further reduction by adding the barrier we see it next to the road. Uh, we should ensure that it is uh, uh, a solid uh, core in that as well. And then we can also add, finally, in the third category, uh, add some masking water feature in, in that space that would make it uh, tick off all, all the three main categories. Finally, I would like to say a few words. I mentioned earlier that this is a work in progress and uh, 2018 and uh, subsequently reporting on a, a study in, in Japanese gardens. So I would like to mention a few of the new soundscape actions that have been developed since the thesis. Was an, and this time it was uh, based on my own experiences from visiting these gardens. Uh, so it was a qualitative approach out the ethnographic, uh, supported by field measurements and recordings. And the aim was uh, to expand the soundscape action design tool. And uh, I wanted to uh, take out a couple of examples, partly because I think they are they could be relevant for. Uh, several other contexts as well, uh, perhaps particularly the one called Tranquility Induced by Contrast, which was a, a, a approach where a loud water feature were located uh, sometimes uh, just next to an entrance to a garden. And this was combined then with uh, a garden wall, which worked as a noise screen. So on the outside of the of the garden wall, we had a kind of uh, em emphasis on we had a louder soundscape, which was created by the water feature. And then when you enter through the gate, the that sound is shielded off, and it becomes a kind of sudden uh, quietness. And this can uh, presumably create an effect of tranquility, which is. Um, something I'm, I'm working on right now, actually trying to uh, see if this is if this is the case, we can measure that effect. Uh, here we have another example of that uh, also involving several other strategies in Japanese gardens. Uh, we have inside the garden and outside the garden of Murinan, which is 40 meters separated. We have a, a road passing through the garden on the outside, and then on the inside, we have uh, we have on uh, we already just now we have just entered, but we had a, a entrance effect, and then we also have several other strategies uh, to create a kind of um, a feeling of being in a distant mountain landscape, involving masking strategies, sounds of water, and several other uh, combined strategies. Another uh, interesting aspect from Japanese garden is the notion of borrowed sonery, similar to borrowed scenery, which is uh, very central in Japanese garden design that you borrow distant landscapes uh, from, this is a mountain which is far away from the actual garden, but it, the way it has been designed is that it looks to be part of the garden. And we can work in the same way. The idea was the, also in, in terms of sound, that we can borrow sounds from from outside the garden and make it become part of the garden. We can actually see a, a borrowed scenery in the last image as well. You see the distant mountain there in that image to the left as well. I then reveal is uh, when um, Another thing that was quite common in Japanese garden is when you're using invisible sounds to create anticipation. That's when you can hear a sound within a garden, but it's not yet visible. So for instance, a waterfall that you can clearly hear, 
encourage you to explore the garden and find the source of the waterfall. Um, we can talk about this as potentially a sound line, as a par parallel term to, to sight line. And we can um, perhaps use this in other contexts as well to uh, create the kind of uh, uh, lust for exploration. The final uh, thing I wanted to mention is the notion of forced perspective, which was suggested in the 1980s as a potential effect in Japanese garden. And this is about a sonic illusion to enhance perceived distance and sight, size. And it is also something that has is very much used in landscape, Japanese garden design in, in visual terms. You use miniature trees and smaller, smaller scale objects to create a kind of um, uh, forced perspective visually. But we can also think about this in, in terms of sound. For instance, if if we see a waterfall and it makes a less let less sound than we expect it to do, then perhaps we will experience that as being further away because with distance, the sound would reduce. Um, and this is also something that would be needed to, to be further studied, but it could potentially enhance, help enhancing the, the perceived size of uh, the small urban spaces. Um, Okay, so so that is uh, that was a summary first of the original soundscape action design tool, and then going uh, back into the uh, developments in Japanese gardens. Future work could be uh, further evaluation and testing in collaboration with practice, assess health effects, integrate new soundscape actions on the website. A map and describe available tools for soundscape design other than soundscape actions, because I think different tools have different applicabilities. And uh, I think there, there is a need for kind of a summary of uh, the ones that existing. So with that, uh, I would like to, to thank you and uh, you can you're welcome to visit the website and interact and suggest uh, and comment on the tool and other aspects you can find on the website and there is also will be some contact uh, references and sound examples so with that I would like to thank you for um, your time and uh, looking forward to uh, uh, talking more about this Thank you. Thank you very much, Gunnar. A uh, very interesting presentation, very practical examples uh, from a design point of view. Um, I would encourage uh, our audience and participants to drop any questions they may have in the using the Q&A function. And while we wait for questions to come in, maybe we can start from the room here, because we also have a few people here in the room. I think Jemima wanted to yeah, comment something. So thank you, Gunnar. That was an absolutely fascinating presentation. I loved your images of the Japanese garden. They just you look at them and it just is so tranquil. I was just wondering if um say you have an annoying road noise and say you masked it with you know nice river noise, um how would you know that it's not affecting people at a subliminal level? So they can't kind of don't hear it as a separate sound, but how do you know it's not going into their brain somehow? It's just an obvious um crossover with lighting is that sometimes lighting can be annoy people and give headaches but you can't actually see the flicker so i'm just wondering you know is i'm very happy to have this seminar with you guys i hope we can work together more but just that to me is a quite a major question i was just wondering what were your thoughts on that thanks um, yeah I, th I think that's a very good and important question i think uh, it is also one that, that needs further for the study uh, to to say for sure, but from what uh, uh, based on, on previous uh, research, uh, there is uh, I think the important thing is is the psychological disturbance from from noise that I think uh, we we can 
I would say we can be quite uh, I feel quite confident that we, we can reduce the psychological disturbance from masking, uh, even though we, we are actually raising the sound level. The sound level itself would, of course, produce a, a kind of uh, arousal uh, in, in itself. And that could be problematic because we raise the sound level. But I think the, the notion that when, when you're thinking about uh, noise and you're, you're, you're actively sometimes can be thinking about uh, oh, this road makes me really crazy. I, I really don't like this environment. And then you're almost trying to to not listen to it actively. And that takes a lot of energy. And, and, and that uh, uh, kind of disturbance, I, I think, is, is a key uh, to to understanding the, the potential health effects of, uh, of masking strategies. And, and that's, but it's uh, certainly a very interesting topping that should be entangled much more. Thank you, Gunnar, because you mentioned uh, health uh, aspects. Actually, we have a question, a related question from the audience. Um, thank you for a fascinating presentation. I wonder what methods are used to link the soundscape factors to health and well-being impacts or outcomes, either positive or negative? Mm -hmm. Also a very important question. And uh, when in the first stage of the development, this was uh, not uh, uh, when when the the soundscape actions were formulated. This was not part of of the uh, the layout, so so that's a potential uh, uh, drawback of the tool. But then, once the actions had been identified, uh, there was a literature review carried out in, in relation to each of these actions and highlighting uh, potential risks and also what the current research situation was. Uh, and in some cases, there is definitely uh, the, the case that there is a need for, for further uh, research to, to, to understand this in, in full. And I, I mentioned, for instance, the tr tranquility induced by contrast and, uh, and so, so So that is... Uh, uh, important question and perhaps it it, uh, it also uh, important to, to stress that uh, when when the tool is is used it, it's a uh, collection of ideas and inspiration uh, where the current research situation is is uh, outlined but in some cases it's also not uh, the picture is not fully understood so to speak Thank you. We have another question, if you don't mind, from the uh, participants again. Uh, for the function localization, do you have any quantitative suggestions regarding the direction and distance and how these parameters can be integrated when designing building, a building or a garden? Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts yeah. about that? Like recommendations about direction and distance from potentially annoying sources? Okay, yeah, yeah that's... Uh interesting aspect also i like to think about uh, particularly when when discussing masking strategies how the direction of uh, the 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 noise and the the masker uh, is important to to consider so that for instance if we want to have a optimal effect that we that we locate the a water feature on the uh, on the same kind of uh, path as where the noise is coming from. And then if you are closer to the water sound, then it is uh, uh, more likely that you will appreciate the, the masking effect that it works. I think it's, uh, it's really a matter of gestalt psychology a lot of the time that there is an interaction between the visual and the auditory and, and the we can speak of foreground and background of sounds. And if we have a water feature in the foreground, I would think that the visual information is uh, combined with the auditory information it can help create the kind of illusion of being in a waterscape rather than in a noisy city. And I think also this is something I... Uh, I thought a lot about when, when studying Japanese gardens that this was... Uh, it seemed to be uh, uh, something they considered uh, in um, 
consciously when uh, in several of these uh, examples for instance um with this notion of uh, borrowed sonary thank you Gunnar. um i have a very uh, last question if you don't mind about, because you mentioned this localization of functions and um of course throughout the presentation you didn't actually refer to any particular ranking when you discuss these three categories uh, like uh, localization of functions uh reduction of unwanted noises and the introduction of positive sounds uh, but of course i mean from our perspective at least the, the smartest thing to do uh, seems to be you know you 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 focus on localization function first so you don't create conflicts in in the first place uh, but then assuming that sometimes this may not or often actually this may not be possible because of constraints and uh, practical limitations related to the site configuration and settings what do you think that you know uh, designers and practitioners should be focusing on uh, what, what should they be giving priority to? Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, when we did the study on the cemetery, uh, where we evaluated the uh, um, cemetery proposals, then the, it seemed to be uh, that the first category was the one that was mostly uh, neglect neglected. Um, so I think, um, and it's also, as you are uh, uh, pointing at, it is uh, a lot of trouble can be avoided if, if you think about it as early as possible. And that is uh, probably the category, which is uh, almost all the time the, the earliest one. So, so I think that is really important one. But then, of course, it's also uh, a category that can be considered in, in several different scales. On the one hand, the whole city, and then uh, within the development project, we can have also uh, different localization of functions. Where do we put the, uh, the, the garden uh, next to a building? Where do they have their kind of restoration spot? And, and so, so it is... Um, um, it is a matter of, uh, um, I think, considering all or all, all three categories is 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 a good and and that seems reasonable to to expect. And then uh, uh, the first category is, as I mentioned, the one that is probably the one that could avoid. It's it's most difficult to to fix in the retrospect, so to speak. So in that sense, it is probably the most important. Thank you, thank you so much, Gunnar. Actually, there were a couple of more questions um, from the audience, but I think we'll leave them. And um, I invite uh, participants to reach out via email so we can, uh, uh, you know, continue this conversation uh, offline. Um, I think we'll take probably a one minute break while we set up for the next speaker who's going to be joining us here in the room. Um, so just um, give us one minute, please, and we'll uh, continue with the second part of the webinar. Thank you. We are, I'm absolutely delighted to, in, to have um, Dr. Shelley James here, and um, she's going to talk to us about human centric lighting. This is one of those uh, really interesting topics in lighting. Um, some people are quite emotional about it. They say, oh, I mean, manufacturers just want to use it to make you know, things more expensive. Whereas the other side is saying, well, you know, we need, um, you know, good lighting design is always human centric. Um, and we should have, you know, this is what it's all about. So I'm going to hand over to Shelley so that she can uh, give us her take on this. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. It's an absolute privilege to be here. And hello, everybody over there. Um, so after the end of today's brief talk, I want to invite you to think about three things. The first is that actually, you're already an expert in human centric lighting, everybody you can see uh, who goes to sleep, um, who chooses a place to sit in a room is already an expert. Uh, the second is that light doesn't exist on its own. We only experience light in context of a time and a place and a surface. Um, and a situation. And the third is that we're amazingly lucky to be working in this field right now. There's so much incredible science coming out right now and so many incredible lighting technologies that we can all use, including obviously daylight and windows. Um, 
that really this is an incredible time to be working in our field. It's never been so incredible before. Okay, first is how many of you guys wear glasses? I can see a couple of people here and I'm assuming there are a few over there around. Them. So everybody who wears glasses knows about about light and vision. They know what it's like to not be able to see properly. They know about focus on the lens. Um, everybody who, who, who gets a bit miserable in the winter, pretty much, yeah, well, we're gonna talk a little bit about how light affects that. You know what it feels like to step off the plane in the spring and go, oh, or to see the sun come up and go, oh, at last. So that's another thing we're gonna talk about. You're an expert in that. Who struggles to get up? Well, certainly my teenage nieces really struggle to get up. So everybody's got a bit, bit of a different body clock. Um, and I'm a super early bird, luckily, because I was up at five, leaving Bridport this morning. Um, so again, you'll be an expert in how light and shade affects your ability to sleep and your ability to wake up on time. And finally, anybody who's ever sat at the end of a day with itchy eyes going, oh, my back hurts and my neck hurts, you will also be an expert in how to set up a computer space that suits you physically and mentally as well. So let's just talk about that amazing piece of kit. Uh, you've got, um, it's actually a piece of brain tissue. Uh, it grows in the very first days and weeks of life. It's the most extraordinary thing. And we still don't understand quite how on earth it works. We certainly don't understand how it delivers so much incredible information with relatively rudimentary wiring, because actually all the wiring is at the front of the light sensing system. So it's, it's, it's not ideally built, but in fact, it's incredible how it works. And I'm just going to spend a couple of moments just reminding you how incredible it is that about 30% of the energy in your own, used by your brain is spent right now. Use processing information from your eyes. Um, it's delivering about the equivalent of an ethernet cable to your brain. Uh, about 20% of your breakfast is currently being consumed by that. Um, it's an extraordinary piece of kit. Um, and what we know now is some things about the way that that piece of kit is built. We've got the back edge of the, the retina, the, the back surface. Um, it's got as much blood running through it as, as your lungs. It's an extraordinary piece of um, you know, blood flow, which is why a lot of issues to do with um, diabetes and stuff affect the way the back of your eye works. Um, so those are the rods and cones, we know about that vision, but we're gonna talk a little bit about the top layer, which is about 5% of that top layer. It's called the intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells. And so they are, they're firing off in response to light all on their own. And we've only discovered that relatively recently and exactly what that means. We're gonna be talking about that later, but it's an amazing piece of kit. Um, so there are two things it's doing. Uh, the first is that it's hopefully allowing you to, to see me, it's certainly allowing us to see each other here. Um, it's a sense-making machine. Uh, it actually, about 70% of what you see um, is, actually only, only about 30% of what you see is new information. Most of it is um, kind of taken on, we, we sort of assume it. Um, it's also working out where stuff is in space. So you can see that just changing the shading, we get shape from shading. Um, just cha changing, and as architects, interior designers, you can do a lot to tell people about how a space is configured by, the, by simple tricks to harness the way the brain works. It's all about context. So in fact, that middle band is the same all the way across. How cool is that and how amazing is that? Because the light in here is maybe a tenth of the light levels outside. Still, it's, it feels all right, doesn't it? I don't know where you guys are sitting, but we're amazingly adaptable, or at least our visual system is incredibly adaptable, and it makes sense that you would be, so that you can cope in different settings. The other thing it does, and I wasn't sure about others, it, it tells you where people are relative to you and their attention towards you. So again, as lighting designers, or as I mean, all the great um, ecclesiastical architecture, all the great cathedrals, use where people are in space and kind of shone light on them or not, to create a feeling of mystery or aggression. Um, and so again, as lighting designers, as interior designers, just where light's coming from makes a big difference to someone's experience of you. And the other thing we know is that it helps us to move around safely. We know that spaces with, with extreme patterns, particularly of daylight, um, encourage trips, falls, anxiety. Um, people with dementia really don't want to even go in there. Equally, we can harness some of those patterns of perception to organize the space so that people feel more comfortable moving through the space. So I mentioned about how you are about half, over half of back and neck and back pain, which is one of the main reasons people take time off work is because of bad lighting. So as people who, as academics, you'll be crouching over your computers. Um, 
So just, we, we ignore that human centric lighting has come to mean body clock lighting, but I'm going to share some other ways in which uh, lighting is for a human is actually it's basically ergonomics. And a lot of what we know now came out of the space station. Uh, we found that um, obviously astronauts stuck in space going out as little as we do, in fact, even slightly even less. And the first studies were actually on ergonomics about lighting. And when they came home, they were like, wow, fantastic. But what they realized how, was how tired they were. And actually they started to live on coffee and, and sugar up there. And they thought, well, if we're gonna send somebody to Mars, this isn't, this isn't gonna work. Um, we can't be doing that. Um, so they kind of tried to work out what on earth was going on and that laid the foundations to the, the lighting technology that we have today and the understanding of that today too. So they discovered that the center of your brain, there's a hot line from that top layer, top layer back, those retinal gathering cells. So the center of your brain then is driving every single cell in your body and your brain all the time. It's just incredible, <coughs> even when you're asleep, because light gets through your eyelids and drives that section. It starts to do that from the first weeks in life. In fact, it seems as though that's a, a slice through, obviously not a, a, a um, diagram of a slice through a, a newborn's um, brain. And that non-visual processing system is more developed. The visual processing system in the back here, the non-visual processing system is tucked in its most kind of private and safe space in the, um, just above, it's something called this suprachiasmic nucleus, it's just at the top of the brainstem. It seems to trigger the first breath, that alerting signal. Mother's um, breast milk has a circadian system, the whole, your everything is working on that. It's, 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 it, I mean, it's hardwired. Um, and what's it trying to do? It's trying to work out what time of day it is particularly, because it needs to know whether it's safe to go out and what to do next. Most of the things that your body does, like digestion or um, attention, take a while to get going. It's like running a busy kitchen. If you're going to fire up the oven, you need to start it in advance in order for it to be ready. So it's looking for slow changes in the qualities of light. Um, and interestingly, dawn and dusk, we tend to think of dusk as being very golden. It has some other properties, but actually evening dusk light is actually pretty full of blue as well. And it's also looking for big changes in brightness. So outside there, it's, it might be 10, maybe 15,000 lux. Inside here, it's maybe 300. Um, and it's looking for, and in moonlight, it's one. And what's amazing is your eye can cope with that incredible range of, of luminances. But it's looking for a big difference between day and night. And those differences let the body clock know what to do next. And so now I've actually got the best lot. <laughs> I should pretty much be awake. Um, and as you move into the afternoon, um, depending on your body clock, your, your chronotype, that's what I'm saying about early, some of you will know that you're night owls and you're not much good around and you probably don't get going till much until lunchtime. And then you probably get a second wind at five and you kind of can go through to late or nine and you're great. So you will know about how light's affecting you by the way it's setting your body clock and everybody's slightly different. We know that if we don't give people that strong day-night signal, they, the body clocks essentially start to free run. So they get you get later and later and later, and that's what was happening through lockdown. You didn't go out, and the teens around me just like, and they, they couldn't see why they were getting up. They had more and more trouble getting up because they weren't setting their body clocks with enough light in the morning and the evening. What that does when your brain receives that information, it's that it's either bright day or it's dark night. It sends a signal, a melatonin signal, that it's gonna you need to get ready. The pineal gland releases a bunch of melatonin and says, okay, it's, it's gonna be dark soon, or it's getting dark. And it, that that signal of darkness ramps up and it gets all your body ready to do things like clearing out waste, like um, digestion, like repair, growth, all that sort of stuff. That's what happens. That's why it's melatonin is the hormone of darkness. It doesn't send you to sleep, but it lets you know that you should be on your way to bed. The amounts that we get are very different. So um, newborn babies have almost none. As we move up into puberty, you get more and more. And then as we get a little bit older, and I won't judge how old any of you are here, but our natural melatonin levels tend to go down. Uh, but we will be very different. There's a 50 times sensitivity, not only between each individual, but also the amount of sensitivity of light at different times of the day. So on that diagram there, you can see that the, um, uh, depending on the number of hours after natural bedtime, the person is pretty robust. You see their melatonin curve, their sleep signal is just fine. But somebody who's very sensitive to, to light after dark, uh, the minute they get any, even just an hour before bedtime, 
melatonin levels completely crash and they really struggle to get off to sleep and the quality of sleep isn't so good either. So that's, and as we get older, our eyes and brains take up less and make, take in less light as well. Doing okay? uh, so you can see that us old, slightly older ones, there's less light getting in as well, which is where architecture and design and lighting can make such a massive difference to the sleep base. I want to make sure that I put in a plug for dark because you need that contrast and some of us are much more sensitive. In fact, we know now that people who live in areas with high light pollution are much, much more likely to experience uh, obesity, depression, um, neurodegenerative diseases. It's, it's literally a killer and it's a killer to the environment as well, not only because we waste about 30% of, of, of energy lighting up the night sky, but also because there's a crash in um, insects and all sorts of other creatures out there too. So if you leave a light on, 100 lux, so a normal overhead light, um, you're much, much more likely to um, have that kind of funny palpitating heart thing in the morning, struggle to, to digest your breakfast, a whole bunch of stuff increases if you don't get enough darkness as much as enough light. Okay. After just one night. Okay, so it also, so your, it sets your body clock, you need bright light in the morning, dark at night. But what seems to be happening, and we're learning more and more about that, is that it also seems to be sending a signal about what kind of activity is going to be appropriate next. So, for example, we know that when it's bright, we're more awake. We're literally more awake. And in fact, if you pump more blue light into a light source, you see much faster reaction times, much faster learning. We'll look at some examples of that in a moment. You can even see people learning to read more quickly, just like a, oh, it's a, it's a wake up call. You can actually see that wake up call now happening in real time, which they couldn't see on the astronauts when they were first thinking about this stuff. We can now see blue light activating the alerting pathway, uh, the, the, um, the salience pathway, which is like, this is important um, in real time. We talked about seasonal affective disorder, and those of you who know how miserable you feel in the winter will know that if you get enough light or even use a sad lamp, you can make a big difference to your ability to cope through the winter. We know that preventative care, using enough light, particularly in, in dementia care, can make a massive difference, actually reduce your risk of experiencing seasonal affective disorder. And now we can actually see that happening. People who feel miserable, who have a low serotonin level, they literally see spaces as being darker. They physically see them as being darker. And we can now see that light and mood connection happening in real time. Evening light, kind of soft, warm light, not like the light in this room, tends to make you feel a little bit more convivial. You tend to have a second helping of cake. Uh, you tend to um, avoid confrontation in, in conflict resolution. There are a bunch of different things that happen when you feel as if you're in a space that people are friendly. And if you like your space with a warm light over a Zoom call, your negotiations are likely to go better too. So let's talk a little bit about um, what that looks like in real life because every situation, everybody needs something slightly different. So when we talk about human-centric lighting, we're talking about lighting for humans in all our amazing variety. We know that if we deliver a substantial day-night cycle to premature babies, instead of keeping them in the dark, they thought the room was dark. Actually, no, it's not. It gets as much light as, as, as the mum does. Uh, if we set the body clock up correctly in, a, in, a, in an intensive care unit for babies, they grow more quickly, they're more resistant to disease, they go, they, they go more quickly. If you, somebody who's it's suffering a sort of delirium or, or um, a coma, if we give them cycle of lighting, they come out better, they come out stronger and there's less um, disorientation. When we go into residential care, we can see some really amazing differences. I'm lucky enough to work at the moment with some old people's homes around the world, and it's just incredible what setting the body clock up and creating environments where the lighting is appropriate for different types of activities shifts the way they behave. It also actually shifts the way the staff behave and feel too, which is pretty impressive because Lord knows we need them. One of the ways I mentioned about ambience, so if you're inviting a friend around for coffee, you're not gonna leave the bright lights on, you're going to turn it down, especially if you're going to romance them a bit. You'll, we found in this particular study, they found um, that after stressful clips of people's, the, 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 the elder, elderly people, they, um, their heart rate dropped. They recovered from a stressful situation more quickly by simply shifting the color of the light. And what a powerful thing that is to be able to do, because now with a Philips Hue or something very simple, you can do that with the touch of a button. 
let's go to schools. We know that design makes up to 16% of a student's um, academic achievement, according to the, some of these big studies. Light, 21%, that, that sense of a natural light, so light that's changing across the course of the day. The ability to change the light to suit you, 28% of that 16%. And level of stimulations from something which is quite busy to something which is softer, that can also make a big difference too. Kids with autism, I'm working with some schools with autism at the moment, and what a difference that makes to them, because a lot of them are really struggling with sensory processing, as we know. If we give teens bright morning light, it sets their body clock up for the day, so they actually get to sleep better that night and the next night after. And sleep accounts for 25% of academic achievement in, in students, so for some of you that would be important. Being able to shift the light, as I mentioned, uh, variability. You can actually shift people's behaviour by simply creating an environment that feels like what they're ready to do next. Teachers, obviously, super keen on that. Um, and the working with some teachers moment who love that ability to shift from focus to calm. Let's just move on briefly into offices because I'm aware of time. Um, what we have here is um, a big study where they did a bunch of stuff on a high-end office. I mean, not everybody's offices are like that, but in, in the CBRE, they invested a bunch because they know that every hour of productivity they gain from somebody is worth rather more than spending a bit of money on lighting design. So they, they found some really phenomenal results. When we get a day night, you think, well, it shouldn't matter because you're only in the office in the daytime, but actually it seems that op optimized day light lighting allows that melatonin, that signal of darkness, to operate more robustly. If we combine daylight, and I haven't talked a lot about daylight because I was just talking about lighting as opposed to light, but we can see that if you combine that correctly, you see some very, very impressive results, not only in terms of sleep, but also behaviours and decision making. There's something special about windows we don't really understand because we think, well, it should be only visible stuff. But there's something else happening. So we can see that if you give people access to a window, not only is their sleep a bit better, I mean, even with the same light levels, sleep better, they move around more. How, how odd is that? There's something else happening when you have a connection with the outside world, which makes you more active. And simply working somewhere where you feel like the lighting is a place you'd like to be, it's comfortable, it's well designed, and it, you can have some control over it. People behave, people are more productive, they're more engaged, they're more loyal. So that was a very quick canter through human centric lighting, because um, I'm just aware of the time. Uh, and I'm going to leave time for questions. The first is really if you think about it, the choices you make every day about where you go, where you spend your time, whether you turn the lights on in the kitchen or how that works. Um, you know already everything you need to know about light and lighting. Uh, you also know that one light now would seem completely weird later on in the day or tonight and vice versa. So light is always in context and it's always in context of the surfaces that you're working with as well. So um, a shiny surface will behave very differently. You can actually increase the perceived light level by up to 20% by shifting the reflectance of the surface. So you can direct light to improve sustainability and comfort um, by in, as, as, as lighting designers, architects, as people involved in the built environment, plus keeping the windows clean, that makes a big difference. And I hope that uh, with my kind of crazy enthusiasm for this subject, I've helped you to see that um, really the time to really have light is, is now. There is, we can do so much, whether it be to do with artificial lighting or great light control, and that that can save energy, save medication costs, save fall, save heartache. Um, and um, and I invite you to uh, to kind of dive into the subject. And I think on the next page, I've got yeah, there's my QR code. To, so if you if you want to find out more, um, just get in touch. And um, yeah, I'm always answering questions, and I absolutely love it, as you can tell. I've got I'm a mountain of references. So, um, but I've only shared a few. Thank you very much for so your time. Okay, so uh, thank you very much, Shelley. That was uh, probably the simplest and most fun way I've heard these complex issues explained. Um, so thank you a lot. That was wonderful. Um, so I'd encourage everyone online to keep your questions coming. Um, this is our opportunity to ask Shelley directly. Uh, there's one here, which I'm going to read out and see what you think. So this, so this is a question from Cleopatra. Thank you very much, Cleopatra. So thank you for these inspiring talks. 
There are some very obvious synergies between daylight and natural sounds, especially in the context of well-being. However, in some cases, we might have conflicting situations, particularly in indoor environments. For example, we might want to increase daylight exposure, but a large window front causes thermal discomfort in summer winter. If we then open the window or turn on the air conditioning to balance this out, we may create, create slash let in unwanted noise. So how do we solve this conflict and how do we decide what the best trade-off is? So that's the first question. It's a great question. And I think that um, the temptation has been to um, sort of tech it, sort of add an app or something. Um, but when you look at traditional architectures um, in, in hot, hot countries or even very cold countries, they have some very valuable, useful solutions for doing that. For example, we know in um, early work on schools that what we call clearestory windows, so windows which are take light in higher up and allow an and air higher up. And then you see this beautiful sort of thermal cycle. We see improved um, acoustic behavior. So I think that sort of trying to retrofit um, a kind of a multi-sensory environment onto a building which has got a hermetically sealed window is, is, is problematic. Um, but I think that's the first thing I would say is to um, detect the situation um, and draw on the incredible history that we have of, 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 of local architectures. So that would be the first thing. And to think laterally about what the options and opportunities are. And I think one of the other things that we often see is that when we give people control over things like blinds, but make sure that they work correctly and um, don't, you know, that, that they don't break and stuff, particularly in special needs schools, we see them behaving in, in quite interesting ways. So I think um, offering people tools to modulate their environment, um, something's trying to break it. Sorry, I'm chewing it. They're going to stop in a minute. It's a little escape. <laughs> it's a little escape. Yeah. Yeah. So, that's your question. I think the first thing is to kind of is to step back from the problem, because otherwise you just end up kind of escalating with tech, um, and say, so what? What are we really trying to achieve here? And that also goes back to when we talk about to something like Florence Lamb looking at the orientation of buildings on plots, just kind of slamming stuff in square because you can get the most property on the plot possible ends up with some unintended consequences in terms of window location and exposure and stuff like that um that's the first one the second one is to offer people control and then um as there are some really beautiful and brilliant things happening in the um electro electrothermic window so where um i think electrochromic windows where you basically put an electrical current through the window and can shift the pattern of uh, of light coming in but we know that the most important part of, of 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 a window is is a view of the sky uh the next bit is a, some analysis is just at three levels so you need sky a, a building or a, a horizon and something in the near in middle distance so um so using some tech in the glass should allow you to offer the benefits of daylight uh, the other thing we know is that we talked about that this afternoon is that windows cut out some of the things that your body needs as well so um that's a long answer, but does that answer the question? Yeah, no, brilliant. Thank you. Yeah, it's, um, these are design challenges that I think have to be often addressed on a project by project basis. So it's um, you did a very good job of uh, uh, answering that in a in a good way. Yeah, that's great. So we've got another question here from our colleague Mandana. She says, "Thank you for your presentation. It's never enough to highlight the oops, more questions coming in, and I can't read it now." So there. So it's never, in, never enough to highlight the various aspects of light and its effect on us. What are your thoughts around the market industry's reactions to the findings on health aspects of light? Do you think they are aligned with the research findings? And accordingly, what are the most urgent and pressing aspects for the researchers to address? Yeah, so we need to know what to do that's useful. <laughs> so please tell us. <laughs> yeah, no, great, great question. I mean, um, I think... The manufacturers have, I mean, there are a couple of things really. One of them is that um, the manufacturers today came out of the light bulb industry. They sold the light bulb, which went into a fitting in the ceiling and there was a switch on the wall. And pretty much that was it. And now we're looking at systems design because the light bulb pretty much, they're, they're mostly similar. I mean, there are some amazing, you know, there, there, there are some amazing ones. There are some ones which allow you to, in you know life's amazing life cycle costing so 
the, the baseline technology in the light bulb is very similar. Now we need to work backwards into a systems approach. So who's controlling it? What else is going on in the room? Uh, is it balanced with daylight? Um, those sorts of things. And most of them aren't really equipped to think in a systems way. And that's where people like you come in, is that um, isolating the light bulb and the wavelength and the light source is really only um, a very it'd be like saying you need an apple well you know that's not going to be a healthy diet it's when you eat it it's deep, deep bright all that other stuff that, that's around um a sort of a system so i think that's one thing that as researchers you can do is to be more um more confident and more um assertive about the need to, to look at a systems approach as opposed to a light bulb approach um and i think the third thing is and i spent a lot of time talking between it's, the manufacturers are your friends because they know that if they can build a more informed more um yeah a, a more informed audience including people like you guys who will be going on to advise clients on what to buy they have um th th their market will improve and they will be able to compete correctly well against those who um are simply um selling start selling cheap rubbish that would go into landfill so i think that my my invitation to you guys is to make friends with the manufacturers the ones who want who are open to a conversation about what's really true or what's really possible to do um, and bring them into your project so that they can uh, work with you to inform our our, our clients on what's really possible, as opposed to kind of going, oh, well, you know, anything sponsored by manufacturers, surely rubbish, or, um, you know, I work with scientists at the moment, and they, they're they stuck with very old lighting technologies because they don't dare or know how to approach a manufacturer who might be interested in um, opening up their, their labs and saying, this is what we do, how can we work together? So I think collaboration is the key to, um, Collaboration and the systems approach and the courage to um, go back to basics would be my would be my recommendation. Yeah, thank you. That's wonderful. We have a question from in the room, so we'll put her hand over. Speak loudly, please. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I was mostly interested just how universal some of the principles that you talked about, like the the effects of blue light or the the scattered shadows and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. In sound perception, we've been able to drive. I would say sort of like some common principles yeah. like introducing natural sounds is usually good but, but it's by no means universal where some people it doesn't work very well and for other people it does work very well so just how universal is it in lighting oh, so it's very similar um and i'd say perhaps what we're always looking at is what 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 would what was the baseline what's the default mm -hmm. uh, and the the in my experience just paying a bit of attention already transforms the situation and then giving people some control. So I think there are there are some basic biologies, some basic um, survival configurations that we that we're all we're all built with. And then the variation within that is massive. So in principle, daylight in the morning before 12 o'clock, any time of year, is gonna help you to sleep better, keep the weight off, um, stay positive. It, as a general rule, after at around two hours before you go to bed, you should reduce everything which is telling your body, however sensitive you are, that you should be awake and it's you know something else is coming up, a meal or you know a potential mate or something. So and that includes light. So that includes speed of light, includes brightness of light, and it improves and it also includes orientation of light, where the light is in the, in the system. And then light needs to be dark and quiet and cool. So those are. You could go anywhere in the world and find the same thing with that. Um, and that daylight seems to have some additional secret source that we don't understand yet, like um, infrared, like ultraviolet, like um, modulations at different times of the day. And I'm sure it's the same with, with sound, in fact. And when we look at how we process light and sound, binocular, binaural processing, and in fact, we know that if you shift the light well, your perception of the sound environment or your ability to cope with aggressors and stressors is vastly shifted. Mm -hmm. So um, so there is a common ground and then there is now the ability to to, to kind of dive into, particularly as, as we get more sensitive, 
um, and as we spend less time outside to dive into some of those variations. Yeah. Brilliant, thank you. Now we have a question from Ted. Hello, Ted Trilsky. I'm a lighting designer. I'm also a lecturer here at Barclay. And I wonder if you allow yourself to be drawn on the uh, on the terminology itself of human centric lighting. Uh, with both my hats on, professional and academic, um, I've railed against this um, phrasing, if you like, for some time. Uh, firstly, because I think it's uh, it's a bit of a tautology. Well, um, yeah. What, what else is there? Yeah. Agreed. So, you know, uh, lighting isn't a physical phenomenon. It's uh, it's something that we experience. Therefore, it has to be human centric. Um, and secondly. Uh, this, and he partly answered this with, with, with one of the other questions. Um, I can't help feeling that the technology has been hijacked by marketeers um, for whom human centric lighting is a fantastic branding exercise. Um, I come back to my question what do you feel about the, the actual term human centric lighting? I mean, I, I'm with you on, on both of those, absolutely. Um, but when we look at what the alternatives are, like integrity, I mean, yes. you know, it's it, 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 in a way it's what we've got. Uh, it's like saying healthy food. It's like what you know. It, it's um, so because it, it it it's meaningless, and yet it it, it has some currency in the world. Um, so, in fact, I was lucky enough to interview Florence Lamb. She talked about the humanity centric writing, and maybe that would be. Yeah. You know, I've just borrowed her, her amazing, you know, she's such an extraordinary woman. So, um, and yes, but in the same way as you would look behind the claims of organic or natural on a tin of beans, you, you should do the same with lighting. And just as you would say, those beans aren't going to make me healthy, but it's how I eat them and when I eat them and who I eat them with, that's going to make a difference. So I think we need to be um, uh, sophisticated in the way that we handle that conversation. Um, but I think that at least it's starting to be on the agenda. And if we don't, somebody's got to make some money in here, otherwise it's not gonna happen. So um, I'm not against a commercial interest, so long as it is um, done with integrity. Does that make sense? Yeah, I was wondering if, if there's potentially some damage to be done to the good science by the, what Richard Feynman might have called the pop science or the, the marketing science. Um, I don't think we're there yet. I mean, when we are there, let's let's talk about it. But right now, I'm going to schools and friends in 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 A and E spent the night on a trolley under under this under fluorescent version of this. So when nobody goes to a classroom and nobody spends a night in a hospital with the lights on, and when nobody spends a night in an Amazon warehouse under fluorescent lights or falls over on a building site because of in, let's talk then. But for now, let's use what we've got. Um, because if we spend our time bickering about the terminology, we don't make progress. Mm. Oh, brilliant answer. Yes, really good. Okay, another question from the audience. Eski, thank you for having for the Please loudly. Loudly. Um, My question is, um, what do you think about uh, clock change, the impact of clock change on circadian meeting? Mm. Because there are some discussion, like some lighting society says, it's not necessary, the clock change is not necessary. We, sh we should stop using this on some part of the society, lighting society against that um, statement. Yeah, no. Okay. What do you think? Well, I mean, all the science suggests that, um, and all the kind of insurance claims suggest that actually there's something like 21% more crashes on the day after, you know, it, it, it's a more heart, you know, the, 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 the stats around the clock change are just, it's, it's like a giant experiment in jet lag. But what's interesting is that um, like taxes, you know, it's coming. We sort of pretending like we're a victim of it. If you spent 50, if you went to bed 50 minutes earlier, you just got to get ready for it. So uh, I'm not suggesting that it's, I mean, Yes, it's an issue, and there's, there's in the way that we live today, the old daylight savings system. It was designed for a world which was very different in terms of how we got to work and when we worked and, and who did what. So it was designed for a different time. But again, it's one of those things where we could spend a lot of time arguing about it. And 
and missed the point that actually a lot of us live with a kind of social jet lag, which means that many of us spend our weekends trying to recover from a Friday night. So let's, or a Saturday night. So if we were, if we took our body clocks seriously, then enough to kind of already organize our days to sleep on time, then yes, let's talk about the clock change. But there are some very, very simple things you can do about shifting the timing early, shifting the meal times earlier, um, those sorts of things that organizing the way you do emails, you know, there are some things that you could do already which would mitigate those issues. Um, so again, like the human centric lighting thing, yes, it doesn't make sense. Actually, it's, a, it's literally a killer, but there are things we can do about it. And until we've done those things first, I, you know, I, does that make sense? Yeah, so pragmatically. Okay, so we have a couple more online questions. So one is, um, thank you for this presentation. How do you describe a space with integration of light, air, thermal and cold as environmental parameters to see the impact of them on a design of a space? And what's all the parameters impact on each other? That's, yeah, that's a big one, isn't it? <laughs> that is a big one. And I think what's interesting is that everybody's different. I mean, if you've ever walked into a restaurant with a friend and they've gone, Blah, blah, oh, it's noisy in here. And you go, no, it's fine. It's kind of buzzy. Or, um, you know, I think every, and some people go, it's warm, particularly as we get you know, menopause and stuff. But, oh, it's warm. So I think we all have our sort of thresholds and expectations about what comfort looks like. Um, and so it's, I think there are regulations in that sort of delivering a middle ground. How you, how you describe their interaction with each other, I think it's very hard to unpick. We are more and more of visual, in, visual people. Uh, here I am, the, you know, you've only, you've only seen me here. You haven't sort of been, we haven't been in each other's spaces in a multi-sensory way. So I think that visual comfort is turning into one of the mo most important things that you as space creators and organizers can support people with. Um, how you unpick that depends on what you're looking for um, and what you're trying to achieve in a space. If you're trying to um, go to the gym, you want it to, the airflow matters more to you perhaps than something else in that environment. So I think it's, it's, it's um, I'm a massive fan of Simon Sinek. Like he always says, start with why. Um, and I think that once you start with why, then, then the kind of the things that matter fall out from that. Wonderful, thank you. Another question here is, uh, so from Hector, who's another colleague at UCL, great presentation, many thanks. Are you aware of any differences in light perception across different cultural backgrounds? Yes, how long have you got? <laughs> um, so, <laughs> so there are a couple of different things here. One of them is that um, if you've ever traveled, which I've been lucky enough to do a lot of, you kind of go to one country, they, 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 their restaurants are so bright. And there's, there's a lot of work around how the, the environments that you grew up in set your threshold for what 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 kind of bright should look like so there is a kind of um and if, if you had slightly like darker skin or your eyes are darker you know you you, you, you need you, your, your behavior with light is different so there's one thing which is to do with um cultural and sort of genetic or sort of physiological expectations which mean that you tend to choose different kinds of lighting environments and then there's the kind of semiotics of light you know to do with co what cozy looks like some of those stuff um there's a wonderful um article well essay uh called in praise of shadows by an amazing japanese architect who i won't try and even pronounce the name but if you have a look online there's a pdf of it and he talks about what the kind of the meaning of lighting environments what 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 the kinds of cultural significance of, of the way we approach light sort of basically shiny and, and shady. Um, so that I recommend you have a look at that. There's some other work on how people, if you give people nods to choose uh, how they would look at an object or a familiar art object or an unfamiliar art object. Um, people from environments or from cultures which tend to identify as being more individualistic tend to choose stuff on a world a much wider range because you can make a Picasso look blue or pink or whatever and you can sort of go, oh, I'm, I'm expressing myself. If you go to a culture which is known to be more conformist, we find that people tend to choose within a much narrower range. So, or more collectivist perhaps than conformist. So the, your, your sense of what, of your own personal identity and your own sort of cultural presence makes a difference to the kinds of lighting you would choose. 
So those are just two examples of, um, of the way that culture affects your, the choices that you make around the lights that you have around you or the places that you spend your time. Fantastic. Um, another question here. So hi, Shelley, I really enjoyed your talk. What are your thoughts on psychological factors? Can we influence our response to light through social attitudes? To what extent? Uh, yes. Um, but I think that, and then we've got another bigger philosophical question about you know mind and brain and you know uh, some of those sorts of things. So uh, we can park that for a moment. If we imagine that it would be possible to separate how you think about something from what your body's doing, uh, you know we can park that. But let's imagine that you could, which I'm not sure about. Um, you can prime somebody in some. So you can kind of offer sounds or uh, anybody who's ever watched a film without the sound on uh, will know how what a big difference that makes. So you can prime somebody, but you can also, with some of the work on, for example, safety after dark, um, how important it is for people to feel safe, particularly women or people who otherwise would struggle to go outside to feel as if a space is, is safe for them. There are ways in which um, the organisation of the light and the story about the space um, affects people's behaviours and their levels of stress in a space. So um, as, a, as, a, as a peer group, you can, with your friends, um, make a different story about what it's like to walk through that park. Um, if you can reinforce that with lighting, that will make a difference. And it doesn't necessarily mean more brighter light, actually. Um, it seems as though as I've said all the way through here, it's all about context. Once the threshold is high, you need more, like like the sound. Once the threshold's high, you've got to turn up the knobs to hear it, get to hear anything. So, um, but I'm aware of the time. So, what I'm saying is that absolutely, context is all. Social context, temporal context, um, physiological context is is absolutely critical. And as as lighting, as kind of space makers, you can do a lot to create that. Wonderful. Thank you. So. Um, Massive thanks for your uh, presentation. We're now through all the questions. Um, thanks for sending those in, everybody, and for everyone in the room for chipping in too. That's fantastic. Um, I will hand over to Nahid now um, just to wrap up. And um, yeah, thanks once again. Thanks. Uh, you need to unmute. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, to our audience and also our guest speakers today. It's a very interesting presentation. I, I learned a lot myself, um, both from the design point of view and also health and well-being point of view. So they were very interesting and with a very clear practical implications. And uh, I, I would like also to thanks uh, to Francesca and Jemima for chairing the sessions and many thanks to our communication team. So I end up now this webinar today. Just to mention the last point, these webinars are recorded. So you will be able to access to them uh, through the IEDE YouTube webinar channel. So it will be distributed uh, soon after. Thank you very much for today. And uh, thanks again to our guest speakers. Thank you.